Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Lit RPG Audiobook Podcast. I'm sure you thought I had disappeared, and I very nearly did. Uh, and I want to take a moment just to thank you all uh, for the outpouring support I've gotten from the community. Uh, I just want to explain a little bit about what happened. Um, it's been roughly a month now. Um, I got extremely ill. Uh, I had a point where I couldn't walk or move without not being able to breathe. I developed a very powerful cough. Uh, I was exhausted nonstop. I had no idea what was going on. I had been to the doctors numerous times. They would give me cough medicine, cough pills. They gave me antibiotics and steroids and that sort of thing. Um, and no one could figure out, well, I should say my physician could not figure out what was wrong with me. Uh, and this is in spite of the fact that I've had what is known as pulmonary embolisms uh, several times in the past, especially when I was going through mortuary school. I had three uh, pulmonary emboli over a three-month period, one after another. And I've talked to my doctor about this numerous times, and in fact, every time I've seen her, we've discussed that. Um, and so I, the last time I saw her, I had said to her, I, I would almost say that what I'm going through feels like the last time I had a pulmonary embolism, uh, except there's no pain. I have everything else except the lack of pain. And she said, well, let's just give you, you know, another steroid and we'll give you another stronger uh, antibiotic and we'll hopefully get you through this. And I said, OK, great. Uh, my other son, my, my, my one son was in the hospital. Uh, he had some issues and we had to go to the hospital to visit him. And when we were there, I was so uh, sick, I could not even walk. I had to get my wife to get me a wheelchair. Now, I'm a big guy, but I get around pretty well. In fact, I can I can probably out-hike a lot of people and do a lot of stuff. In fact, I used to do uh, karate. I studied Taekwondo for a number of years. I'm still um, pretty powerful leg-wise. I've never gotten out of breath walking around or running around. Um, so uh, as things were going, it was getting pretty serious. And my wife had just had double knee replacement surgery, so she couldn't walk. Uh, and she was trying to push me through this hospital. We ended up having to get two security guards to get us through the hospital to go see our son. And as we were leaving, I said, I, I can't move. I can't breathe. Um, and she said, you're going to the ER. Uh, I got to the ER and they said, um, three weeks ago before you got here, uh, you suffered your first pulmonary embolism. There's traces of that right here. Uh, about a week and a half ago, you had another one. There's traces of that right here. And you still have really big clots in both sides of your lungs, uh, in your pulmonary arteries, and so you can't do anything. Uh, and that really kind of <laughs> uh, solved what the mystery was. And it really made me upset because my doctor knew these sorts of things could happen and overlooked it completely. But the nice thing is, is I did get confirmation that I am a mutant while I was in the hospital. Uh, and by that, I mean I have what's called a factor five mutagen factor, or factor five mutagen, which means that I actually have a superpower. And my superpower is that my blood will decide to clot all on its own whenever it feels like it. Um, <laughs> so I could kill myself at any time, depending on how angry I make my blood. So I'm now on warfare and incumidin, so on and so forth, uh, whichever one they, they're going to give me here uh, once we get everything straightened out uh, for the rest of my life. It should keep me fine. I should be okay. Um, but I had a really rough couple of weeks, and I really want to say the community, uh, I would pop in periodically when I could, say something, and move along. Um, but I never really got my, I didn't get anything accomplished. And in, in the four-week period that I was ill, including this week, which would make week number five, I have gotten nothing done personally. Um, absolutely nothing. I have not been able to read, listen. I have not been able to write. Uh, I'm just back to work this week. It's on late duty. I don't go back until full duty until the 15th. So I have really been off the grid, so to speak, for the most part. Uh, and, I, and the doctor pretty much explained to me how close I came to dying. Uh, but I, I do... <laughs> it's one of those things where I, I realized that was the case um, as I was in the hospital and I thought... Uh, yeah, I think this is just about it. Either they're going to come in and tell me that my heart is really bad and um, I don't have much longer to go, or they're going to tell me I had a pulmonary embolism. And I didn't expect to have two. So this makes my fifth pulmonary embolism that I've had, and uh, so on and so forth. And like I say to people all the time, I'm pretty tough. 
I can take a lot of stuff and, and breathing doesn't stop me. It won't stop me from, from living or whatever, but, um, it was really close. It was pretty tight. Uh, and the community, every time I turned around, they were asking, somebody was asking me how I was doing, how I felt today. Uh, you know, Annalise Rennie and, and, and Lavelle Jackson, especially, I mean, Lavelle has been my biggest support. I mean, uh, as crazy as it sounds, um, the man, and I don't want to say it's crazy, but the man has been there literally every day while I was ill, checking in and asking how I was doing and going back and forth. Uh, and we might not have talked a lot, or we might have chatted as much as I could have, uh, but he was there. But everybody, you know, if I made a post and said something, everybody said they hoped they were, I was feeling better, and it really helped me a lot. So I do want to take a few seconds and just say thank you very much for the support that you have given me. Uh, it, it means more than you will ever, ever know. Um and like I say, I do want to thank my wife uh, publicly for saving my life, uh, because if she hadn't taken me to the hospital, I would have just come home and died. Uh, and I'd have been fine with that. I was pretty cool with it in the hospital when they were checking me out, and I thought, this this could be it. I'm going to go any minute now. And uh, I realized I'm pretty cool with death. I'm not afraid of it, and it doesn't bother me. I've done everything I need to do, and uh, I, have, I have aspirations and dreams. But um, if I got called away right now, I would be okay with it. Um, but I do need to thank my wife. Uh, I love her a lot. and She saved me uh, more than I ever realized. Uh, this is just one more chalk up on the event horizon, so to speak, on what I owe her metaphysically, metaphorically, uh, you know, however you want to lay it out. I owe her a lot, and she saved my life. Uh, but again, the community has been there for me more than I would have expected. I'm very surprised, um, and it's just been great to get back. I really have anticipated looking at uh, reviewing these books, I have books that I've wanted to review. I can remember laying there in the hospital or even when I couldn't breathe and just sitting there thinking, I really want to talk about this book or I want to talk about that book. And I guess the good thing is, is having been away for practically four weeks or five weeks, uh, in the last show, thankfully that I did, I had actually pre-taped it ahead of time so that there was a week where I had a show that wouldn't have appeared if I hadn't had that done. Um but I just kept wanting to get back to this, get back into the community, be able to interact with the people. Um, but just, just thank you all. God bless. Um, and I'm not trying to shortchange anybody. If you've asked about me, I know like James Hunter and Jeanette Strode, uh, Dakota crowd, you guys have all asked me how I'm doing and checked in and Joshua, you know, Mason, uh, just everybody has come together and just, just seen how I was doing and, and, and made sure I was okay. So again, thank you all. And very much, very much appreciative of everything you've done, you know, and the outpouring and saying if I need something, um, I'm good. I don't need anything. Um, but it's it's just been a rough couple weeks, but I'm back. I can breathe now and I can sing and I can do other things. Um, so, you know, uh, I'm hoping now to get back. Now, today, this is uh, my first show back, so I'm trying not to overdo it too much. So I know normally I do four, but I'm going to do five uh, reviews this week. Uh, and then after this, I have um, specials made up uh, since I had enough time to, to go through it. I'll have a dungeon special and I'll have an apocalypse special and a couple other things down the road. So I just want to kind of give you a, a taste of what's to come with those. But for now, for now, um, I'm going to review a book, which I haven't done forever. Have not done forever can't wait to do this so the first book i'm going to review is <laughs> competitive advantage nora hazard series book two by blaze corvin narrated by emily beresford uh with a book length of seven hours and 45 minutes on security already so sauron was spared some damage and hardship i still have you to thank for some of it though now you know Good luck in your travels. You will always be a friend to Sauron. Vyrie P. I shook my head and carefully folded the note, stowing it in my pack again. I'd already read it at least ten times, and I knew there wasn't anything else to learn from it by now. Something big was happening, that was for sure. True demons. The only reason I hadn't shuddered again while reading that part was that I'd already thought about it so much. True demons were dark, terrible business. If the reports were true, Neben had had at least a few hundred people, and now they were all gone. This had been a bad year for me to decide to meddle in the lives of others, to use my power to protect. As usual, my timing had been terrible. And yet, this wasn't the first time I'd thought about my terrible timing. 
Okay, so, like I said, I've been wanting to get to this book in particular for a long time. I, I can remember um, reading Asgard Awakening, um, and I thought, well, I'll read, I'll, I'll review Asgard Awakening and then give it like a two weeks or three weeks uh, and then get back in and do, you know, Nora Hazard, because I try to break it up a little bit. Uh, I, I don't want to go overboard very much with the same authors or narrators too often, um, uh, but in, in this community, you get a lot of the same people over and over again because some people write like crazy. Other people write a little slower. Uh, like Blaze Corvin, he will say, you know, he takes a little longer uh, to write. And, you know, like I said, I was trying to be fair with with him and other against other people. Um, so I tried to spread that out, and it just kind of got pushed to the wayside, so to speak. And so I'm doing the same thing with a couple other books here. Uh, like I'll do Merchant of Tikba 2 for Charles Dean. Uh, because I've had that book for a while, wanted to get to it, just never had a chance, uh, because I had re reviewed War Return is 4, and I said I'll put this back, and then go to it, and just never got back to it. So again, um, I, I do want to say, you know, I, I try to be fair with books, but with the outputs of some people compared to others, um, some people get, you know, like, like I'll have William Morand here um, in the next couple weeks, like a few times, because he's there, and Andrea Parsnow, will be up about four or five times because she's done Dan the Barbarian and she's done both Iran books and a couple other things. So I can't get past that. Sorry. So again, apologies. Anyway, this is the second novel in the Nora Hazard series. And if you know Corbin, you know he says he doesn't write fast, but he's well worth the wait. Okay, Ludus. Ludus. It is an amazing place to visit even if it doesn't star Jason and Henry, okay? Um, and he proves that with Nora. Now, speaking of him, I have to say that Nora is actually, if I take this back and dissect it, um, one of the better built characters that I will ever find or you will find in lit RPG or any other kind of writing that you would do. Now, I don't mean that, you know, that she's uh, built like a brick outhouse or, you know, she's a brick house, like that. Um... Because if you look at the covers, uh, one thing I'll say about Blaze Corbin, um, he hides Nora's face because apparently in the books, uh, as far as I can tell, she's not very attractive looking, at least in her own opinion. Now, I know a lot of women, or I have known a lot of women who thought they were very unattractive, but they were beautiful. Um, and that, so I don't know if that's the case with Nora, although she's said to be a little bit more, you know, whatever. Um, but if you look at the covers, it's always Nora's backside. But... Her backside is not, um, how do I put this, like one of the sexy girl backsides. It's it's a regular person backside. Um, you know, her rear end is not something you just zoom in on and go, oh my gosh, that's a great rear end. It's You look more at the picture of the cover and say, wow, that's really good. So um, with Nora, as built as she is physically, um, I think she's better designed as a character. Um, she is believably defined and grows in a very sensible manner. For example, um, Nora lived on the streets and pretty much had a mindset that dealt with her surviving from one moment to the next. Now, this instinct has both benefited her and been a drawback as she's developed through book one and in book two. Uh, for example, it made her a great fighter because, you know, she wasn't worried about what's going to happen after the fight. She was worried about what was happening at that moment. Um, but the drawback is the same thing. She didn't have like a foresight as to what she was going to do after she won in case she, you know, she did win. Um, but it's kind of one of those things where she, she's really slick and smooth on her feet and she kind of lived in the moment. And now we're beginning to see her be able to sort of think ahead and, and really consider the future. Uh, I think the last book, she was basically stuck in the moment mourning her the death of her friend it happened at the very beginning of the book and and i i, I believe and it's been a long time since i i've reviewed this um one of my big complaints was it seemed like she bemoaned the, her friend's death throughout the entire book which was very realistic i'm a funeral director and i'm complaining that there's a person grieving through the entire book where if she hadn't i'd have said well you know her best friend got killed and you know she got over it within three pages I guess I can't be pleased, um, but that's what I'm talking about. She was kind of stuck in the moment. In this book, we kind of see her shed that mentality. Um, it, it's partially because of her powers, but also because of the way her powers 
have allowed her to change. Now, what that means is, is she might, um, well, she doesn't might, she has what you might call photographic reflexes. Now, if you're a Marvel fan, you'll know that that's like from Taskmaster. Uh, and Taskmaster is one of Captain America's big villains. And basically, if he sees you do something, he can replicate that movement. So, you know, if Hawkeye, if you're a fan of the Avengers, shoots a bow, pst, he can shoot a bow just as good as Hawkeye. Captain America throws his shield, he can throw his shield just as good as Captain America. Shang-Chi, the master of Kung Fu comes in, he can do the same thing. Nora has the same ability. Now, I can't remember what they called it in the book, but for me, I'm just going to refer back to it as photographic reflexes. Um, so, like, Kung Fu, archery, gymnastics, even drawing um, are within her purview of capabilities, which makes her really versatile, really, really versatile, uh, and very powerful. Because if you think about it, um, there's really nothing that she can't do once she's seen it done. OK, so that means there's a hell of a lot of stuff that's within her grasp. She can now become the world's greatest thief because she'll learn how to sneak. She can learn how to pick a lock. She can do all sorts of things. She can be a great fighter. If she sees the greatest swordsman fight, she can fight into a standstill because she'll be just as good as him. Um, this makes her just a little bit more deadly than your average sword hand. And again, I'm not trying to take away from like uh, Jason and Henry, but Jason and Henry get by more on their innovative thought processes with their, their inventions than they do their powers. Now, of course, for me, like the greatest scene ever in Delvers is where, you know, they're, they're fighting the, the, uh, the, the, the one head priestess of, uh, of, uh, not Ludus, um, the great god, um, oh my gosh, I can't think of it. The, the, you know, anyway, um, they're fighting the head priestess and, you know, they're burning through all their stuff. That is like an incredible thing. And that was a fist fight. That was like a down and dirty, drag them out, kill each other battle. Um, and, and that was really kind of a step away from who, you know, Jason and Henry are because that was a, that was a, a, a straight up fight. And not that they don't have straight up fights, but they usually think things through. Here, you know, um, Nora um, has this, this this ability now, so she's going to be able to think things through. But she also has something I'm considering as, as hyper vigilance, um, and and this allows her to speed her consciousness up so that things appear far slower than they are in real time, which is a really big boon in battle. In other words. Um, if I'm fighting the greatest Kung Fu artist of all time, and I have the same capabilities as that person, but I can slow down time in my perception, that basically makes me Neo getting shot bullets at by, you know, the agents. I can dodge those bullets and come up and smack the crap out of you before you even know what happened. Uh, and that's her now. She can, she can react with that hypervigilance by that, and also allows her to study things more in depth and to think things through further than what she normally could, because now she's got this extra time she can consider stuff. So her powers develop right along with her character, which is really nice. It's fun, and that's one of Corbin's really hallmarks uh, as a writer, uh, because as much as I, I, I will say this, I love Jason and Henry, their innovation and their inventions grow as they develop. You know, they start doing this, that, the other thing, and they tr train and practice, and they come up with new ideas, the more powerful they become, they say, well, we can apply this to this now. And it's the same thing here. I really, really like how, how this, this goes along. So she no longer feels like a street rat who got lucky, but rather, but rather someone who is about to grasp her destiny by the short hairs and then pull it along in the direction that she wants it to go. And I honestly don't know if Pew Pew is a nod to Dave Wilmarth or not, but it's still an awesome ability nonetheless, okay? Um, finally, Nora says some very powerful and poignant last words. Not as in, uh, uh, I'm dying, like I would have had last words, but then as the last things she kind of says in the end of the book. So keep your ears out for that, because th that was pretty good, and it really makes me, I just want the third book now. Um, but also, here, here's my dilemma, okay? I really like Nora a lot, but I kind of want the book to end so I can get to Jason and Henry. But if I do that, then 
Jason Henry in. So I don't know. I'm kind of like, <laughs> I'm kind of torn. I, I don't want to see Nora disappear. I don't want to see her, her story end, even though I know she's going to be in Delvers from this point forth when Delvers continues. Um, oh, The Great God Dolos. There it is. I knew it would come to me. I haven't read it in so long. Uh, it's been so far so far back. Um, I couldn't think of Dol Dolos' his name because um, I read this a while back. Um, anyway, uh, there's just, just a lot that goes on here, and it just really, really draws you in. And the book has some amazing pacing, believable dialogue. That's really important. Great action scenes and some downright auspicious world building that really helps to flesh out the world of Ludus. And its inhabitants, which is important because they're not just background crappy characters. Corvin is one of my gateway lit RPG drug people. He is a total red pill. I mean, if you know what I'm talking about, he is a red pill because once you've swallowed his little story, you'll find yourself in a place you don't ever want to leave. Um, five Delver books won't be enough. Three Hazard books won't be enough. So there's only one more Nora to go. And, and you know, like I said, it, it's it's a bittersweet thing because it, it gets me to delvers quicker but it ends nora so i you know the only thing i have to ask is if you haven't read these books i'm asking why why haven't you read any you know one or two or three of delvers uh why haven't you read one and two of nora they're amazing so the only part i need to talk about is going to be the narration now, as for the narration i have to say that em emily beresford nails it uh, total pro and, and she really gives life to this novel i have to say that i find her voice very pleasant very pleasant and soothing to listen to um, but she also knows how to elevate a menacing moment or interject interject actual danger into an action scene i mean she can get plain mean when she needs to or be very very menacing i mean like it's like you know there's a rabid vampire bat flying around a naked man who's in a room full of razor blades. Um, you know something bad is going to happen. And she makes you feel that way. You are the naked guy. And why are you be in a room full of razor blades naked? I don't know. But I'm just saying, you're that naked guy. That's how bad she makes you feel. She makes you go, oh my crap, something is going to happen to me? I don't want anything to happen. She's versatile. Very versatile. My final score is going to be 8.4 stars. This is a great book. It's really building to something special. And I don't really see anything wrong here. Uh, this is just an amazing series altogether. Side characters like Jessica were fun. And the direction of the tale is, of course, on epic level storytelling. So go get it now. All right. Now, the next book I am reviewing today is The Merchant of Tikpa 2 which is book five in the Bathroom Night series, which is written by Charles Dean, narrated by Matthew, 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 Matthew Broadhead. Um, but his head seems normal in all the pictures I've ever seen of him. Um, with a book length of 12 hours and 34 minutes. Please tell me you have a plan this time, Shy, Reginald shouted. The satyr was dressed in enough green leather armor to put a leprechaun to shame on the ridiculous American version of St. Patrick's Day. And he was currently doing his best to run away from several lumbering ten-foot-tall giants. Although they were dressed in furry red costumes that hid their bulging muscles and made them look like a group of part-time Santa Clauses who had been rejected from the shopping mall food court, little was done to dampen their imposing figures. When do I ever not have a plan? Locke, who went by the in-game name Shy called back. He was crouched down behind a rock along the path Reginald was following through the field, patiently waiting for the rapidly approaching mob. A solid metal hammer, shinier than polished chrome in one hand, and a bottle of poisonous fluid in the other. Is it too much to ask that just one of your plans not involve me being strung out for bait like a worm on a... All right, all right. Yet again, I get to lament the end of this series. Now, you may recall in my review of The Bathrobe Night 3 uh, that I sort of got all maudlin at the end of Mamone that there were no more audiobooks coming from this series. Um, a series that both I and my family deeply love. Uh, we listen to the BK Night, uh, the BK series uh, on road trips. And for my kids, it's always a fight. They either want to listen to like Larry Korea's Tom Stranger 
or Charles Dean's Night Series. Uh, and BK, you know, thankfully Dean has more BK novels. Uh, and so, you know, Tom Stranger has two at the moment. So Dean wins, and we get to listen to those. Um, but this one was a sad one for all of us, because... It really is the end. Um, the bearded one has pretty much confirmed, confirmed, confirmed that the series ends right here. Right here. Um, it's pretty sad. Uh, that doesn't mean that I won't keep begging him to write maybe just like 500 words a day on a book that will kind of tie up both Locke and Darwin's stories. Do you hear me, Charles? For just 500 words a day, you can feed the starving ears of my family and the families of, and fans of millions of other lit RPG readers out there who need more of the Bathroom Night series. BK is one of my earliest lit RPG books out there, and it seems a shame to just kind of let this fade away. <laughs> just really sad. Really sad, Charles Dean. Really sad. Begging aside. Uh, I'm really sorry to see the series end. It has been one hell of a ride. Uh, and for anybody who can flip Shakespeare on his ear uh, and slip him into a game world, it is a real master. Uh, this book should be called like classical lit RPG, uh, even though you don't need an English degree to kind of follow along. Uh, it helps if you're familiar with Shakespeare, but if you don't, you don't have to worry about who's representing who and what part of the story comes up and all this sort of thing. Just enjoy it. Just enjoy it. Now, um, if you really want to prove your chops, Charles, go after Chaucer and make one of those Canterbury Tales into a game lit masterpiece like this. Yeah, I know you can do it. Anyway, the book is just as fun as the preceding four novels. In fact, I'm almost want to say that I enjoyed the last two books more on their own than I did the first three. Um, and that's not to say that the first three weren't great because they're, they're the ones that hooked me and, and drew me into enjoying Charles Dean's writing to start with. But um, these kind of have their own flavor and personality, uh, and, and I enjoyed them a lot just because um, <clears throat> it's it's a bit more cohesive with the, the party, party uh, and, and stuff like that, where the other one, it kind of had different characters. Like you would have the king doing his stuff, and then you'd have Darwin doing his stuff, and you would have, like, each person, and it wasn't, like, a, a unit of people until, like, the very end. Um, and here it, it is. It's, it's a nice unit of things going on. Uh, and I enjoyed that a lot. Of course, no one in this book is killed with a spoon. So I think the BK series wins the first three uh, because the main line, there is people that get killed, you know. I'll cut y'all out with a spoon. Why a spoon? Because it would hurt more, you know. That's not the way it plays, but he does kill people with spoons, and it works really well. Uh, anything can make my wife laugh, who has, she has, she, my wife has zero, zero sense of humor. Like, she will literally watch something, and it will be uproariously funny and hilarious, and I and my kids will be laughing, and she will go, that was funny. Straight faced. Straight faced. I don't care who it was. She could be watching Richard Pryor. I don't find comedians funny. I don't care what happened. Straight face. Never a laugh. This book made her made her chortle more than a few times. She literally laughed a couple times. So I know Charles Dean can can really make people laugh. I get his humor. My wife gets his humor. Uh, I think that's great because if you can make my wife crack a, a smile. With a joke, you're doing something. If you can make her chuckle, you're amazing. And if you can make her laugh, then you are a god. Okay? So I think for here, for the book, I'm going to digress here um, and get back to the story. Um, the highlight was having Shy kind of shifting away from being the humble merchant crafter guy into something that was kind of akin to a mob enforcer. I don't know if that's an accurate description of it, but he kind of goes from being like, you know, this like, I'll craft and I'll do this and I'll to being like some tough guy, you know. Um, it was just funny. And, and can I also say, just milk cannon? Are you kidding me? Milk cannon? Now, I'm not talking like Dolly Parton after pregnancy, Charles Dean. You make me say bad stuff. 
bad stuff. I was going to make a joke about um, milk cannons, and I stopped. I stopped. Uh, and by the way, the shy guy is literally screwed in the end, and that was really sneaky how you did that. I likes the sneaky. Um, seriously, you couldn't create a, a Yago type character for this book. He would have been perfect here. I know he's not from like the, the Merchant of Venice, but Yago would have fit really good. Um, so how can you you know you do the one true part and not include his greatest character? That's what I want to know, Charles. That's what I want to know. Um, anyway. Um, there's a lot of funny stuff. There's really good fighting. Uh, and like I say, you know, there's just stuff that makes you want to squirt milk out of your nose. Out of your nose. Not your milk cannons. Okay. Um, as a bonus to, to listing out there, uh, the book almost feels like a standalone book. Yes, it has ties to the preceding books. Yes, it is a follow-up right from the the fourth book um but I, it kind of feels um like the novel changes things up enough it adds enough new characters uh, that you could kind of come in cold and still know enough about what's going on to enjoy this just as if you had been with the series the entire time and that's not to take away from what came before but i i really think that with what he does here this book is almost unto itself a complete book now, that doesn't mean it's a complete series. I'd like to point that out, Charles. It's not a complete series. It's just a complete book. And it is really good. Uh, and I enjoyed it a lot. Um, but it, if I was coming in off the street and you said, Here, here's a book, and I'm like, well, this is book four, or, you know, or this is book five, or this is book six. I want the other five or six books ahead of this. Man, you're good. Take book five and read it, and you will enjoy it. I dig Dean's humor. I got a lot of laughs out of this book. It was thoroughly enjoyable for me uh, from start to finish. And I recall when I finished it, I said to myself, I can't wait for the next book. <laughs> I can't wait. <laughs> it's, it's not coming. Not coming. Um, so I know new readers will enjoy this book uh, on its own, even if they haven't read the first four novels. But they will go back and buy them afterwards. So if you're unfamiliar with the Merchant of Tikpa or Bathroom Night series, check this one out. Um, it's really good. Plenty of fights, funny stuff, um, oblique references to English lit characters, just enough stuff to keep you interested for the entire runtime. Uh, Matthew Broadhead, um, who has hit homers with this and the last Merchant of Tikpa book, does a great job here. I think he gets Dean's humor and style. And the only other person I can say that about is Jeff Hayes. Uh, because Broadhead, in the past, it's kind of been like a hit or a miss with me. Um, and, and when it was a miss, it was a pretty bad, like, Warscapia. I had, like, one point where he, he did this zombie duck quack that was just really funny. It made me burst out laughing. The rest of the book, it was flat, and I just did not enjoy it. Um, but going back here, he, he comes back in. And I'm not trying to say I don't like like brought it um but just some of the stuff either it really flies or it really falls and with charles dean's work he really flies it, it just kind of goes right off into the sky um he seems to be batting 500 with charles so you know he's fun to listen to his inflections make me laugh heartily he carries the humor he carries the action he carries the fights uh it's it's really well so here in this instance he, he knocks it out of the park he really does a really good job. Uh, and so I, I will say Matthew Broadhead is a really good fit for Charles Dean. Um, final score, 8.4. I know you want more, Charles. I know you want more. But it's the last book. The last book. I can't go higher because I can't give you what... There's no there's no wrap-up. There's no conclusion. I need more. More. Anyway, um, I'm sorry to see this series end, seriously. Um it's like I say, it's one of my like I probably said at the beginning of the, the Delvers review that I did for Nora Hazard. Um, this is one of my earliest lit RPG books. Uh, and so to see it come to a close to a conclusion, um, it's kind of sad. And, you know, <clears throat> to have it not be completely wrapped up with a nice little ribbon is, is a bit sadder still. 
Um, so I hate to see this series end. Um, I just wish we could get more out of it. And maybe in 10 years, Charles will be able to go back and say, oh, I, I now have enough money here. I can go back and write something just for the fans and finish this series up. Um, well, let's hope that's the case. Uh, because it's, it's well worth your time and interest uh, to check this series out. So 8.4 stars. Okay. Next up is Soda Pop Soldier by Nick Cole, narrated by Guy Williams, with a book length of 12 hours and 27 minutes. The war starts at 6 a.m. in game time. By 6.45, we're losing Hamburger Hamlet as our entire line begins to disintegrate. It isn't a total collapse. Pockets of resistance hold out in key positions, buying Colocorp time, expensive time, to fall back and reorganize. On my right flank, Kiwi holds a high hill overlooking the Songhua River Basin. We call that hill Wondersoft Garage because of the small power station and vehicle spawn depot located there. Wondersoft had made the capture of that hill and power station a primary objective in the last three battles we'd fought at this end of the basin. And it looked like they were going to try for it again today. So, I'll kind of tell you how I found this book, um, which is weird. Uh, I was kind of looking at reviews of Ready Player One. Um, I haven't read the book yet. I have watched a movie. Um, and, and I can't remember why I was looking up reviews about it. I wanted to see if people thought that the movie was better than the book, or the book was better than the movie, or something along those lines. And there was this one line, this, this one thing that... Um, struck me as odd. I didn't understand why it was worded the way it was. Um, and the radio review was talking about MMO Punk. Now, the review was more about um, Cole and his earlier books, a prequel to this one. Uh, but it mentions Ready Player One, and that was actually, actually what pulled that up, but I was reading through it and I thought, what the hell is an MMO punk. I've never heard that term before. Uh, and it's basically, the, the, the article was written in 2015. So for all those people that were living way back in 2015, um, it, it's kind of like the precursor to Lit RPG, apparently. It's, it, it's what they consider to be a mashup of cyberpunk stories and MMO RPGs, i.e., that is the RPG gamelet stuff that we, we talk about now. Um, and I thought, man, that's, that's, weird how that ever even evolved i've never heard of mmo punk um and the fact that you know the guy referred to this story as like um i think it was mmo noir or something along those lines uh which i didn't get that from this uh, i'm a noir fan uh i mean i grew up watching noir style movies with my grandmother um so i'm an old old fan of that kind of style of film and, and books and radio. Um, and I don't get noir from this, this at all, but that's just me. Um, but the novel is mentioned. So I thought I would check out the soda pop soldier. Uh, and I'm glad I did. I didn't get the precursor to it or the prequel or whatever you want to call it, which is something, something revolution, um, which I may do in the future. Um, it just depends on who narrated the book here has some pretty interesting concepts about corporate sponsorship and making a living via virtual games. Now, if you know me at all, and I probably will say this uh, in every single review I do this this episode, um, I hate it, hate it, when in-game currency is usable in the real world, uh, but it's different here. Cause, you know, For me, I take the concept and say, I don't care what the exchange rate would be, I just don't see it working realistically. Um, but this was different because... The people here earn money by earning advertising spots. In other words, let's just say that there's there's one billboard in town, okay? And you have a team of paintball people, and there's another team of paintball people. And whoever wins, their sponsor gets to put whatever they want on the billboard. They get to advertise there. Okay, and it's the same thing here. Um, uh, there, there is a game that is kind of like... Um, uh, you know, it's, it's a battle game and it's set in a war world. Um, and it's like Call of Duty a lot. Uh, and here there's different sponsors and they're struggling to see 
where they can get their advertising space. Now, the main character, his name is Perfect Question. Uh, and really, I think that is actually his name because he, if you, you, you listen to the book, he gives his name a few times, but it's never the same. And I don't believe he ever tells the truth about who he is other than he's the Perfect Question. Now, Perfect Question is one of these people who is this close to losing everything. His girlfriend's getting ready to walk out on him. Um, he's about to lose his apartment because he can't pay rent. He has nothing else going on in life. Um, he's going to lose his job because if they don't, if his team of, of soldiers don't step it up, they're going to be booted out by their sponsor. So he's going to lose his house, his job, his his, his girlfriend, uh, probably his cat and his best friend and everybody else. That's just how his life is going. It's going right down the toilet quickly, uh, and and. So he is trying to figure out a way to survive one moment to the next. So, again, this book is one of those ones that kind of makes you say, um, this this is more like um, how you earn money on like YouTube or streaming uh, and survive that way than taking money from the game itself and, and doing that. They earn money through actions in the game, but it's, it's real-world money. It's not game money. So... Here, the main goal was everybody is to play well enough to learn, you know, earn, you know, the advertising space and, and make a make a life out of themselves. Um, and like I say, the perfect question isn't just in, in a lot of crap. So what happens is he ends up taking to playing an illegal game just to get by. And that's where the fun really kind of starts, because um, perfect question doesn't seem to fit into the real world. Uh, in fact, he seems like he is more at home in virtual reality, in spite of the fact that he literally lives in a world where it seems like humans regularly leave the planet. Did I say that quickly enough, or did I say that wrong? Regularly leave the planet. I mean, there's like space travel and all kinds of things. Uh, it's a very advanced-sounding world, but he just doesn't want to get out there and do things in that world. He kind of is, is hunkered down in his little safe space, which is virtual reality. Um, uh, the, the illegal game that he goes into is called The Dark, uh, and it's just... That uh, although his other game War War World is pretty visceral and violent, I mean, how could it not be with with that? And, and it keeps you in the action enough to keep you focused. The Dark is one of these really deep games. It has more to it than what you think at first. Um, the book kind of bounces between each game and the real world, but it does so in a way that keeps you interested. I often get bored with, and I've said this before, uh, out of game sequences uh, in, in in books. I, I really don't care what the devs are up to, or how the AI is slowly taking over the world, or whatever's happening in IRL. I like to, once you are there, stay in the game. This book opens in the game, so you're already in the game. But it's not one of those things where you're in it for 18 months or whatever. It's just you, you log in like you were playing Call of Duty. You, you do what you got to do, and then you hop out. So um, this one does a really good job balancing everything at the same time and keeps you on the hook. Um, you generally care about PQ, uh, and it doesn't matter if he's playing a soldier or a samurai or if he's just struggling as an average guy. Um, for me... Uh, the real plus was with the authentic feel the book had in regards to how the players of Cola Corp interacted with each other. Um, if you listen to the story, it really, really feels like it's a group of people who are playing Call of Duty and they're trying to get their crap together. Like one guy's screaming about something, another guy can't do his own thing right. The other, you know, everybody's doing whatever they're doing, and it just sounds like. It's a real group of people. I swear to God, I, I would have thought that he probably sat there for, you know, 18 hours listening to a group of, of COD players and just started jotting stuff down and saying, Oh, I'll use that and I'll use this because it's very authentic sounding. It really, it really is. It, it really feels like, um, he's played. And, and that's right. The, the MMO punk just blows me away because to me, it, it on the covers, it says lit RPG. Um, so I'm sure that. When they started doing the, the the updates for the audiobooks, because he wrote the book before this came, you know, the lit RPG stuff existed. The you know the the audiobook people said, "Hey, let's just make this lit RPG," and he went with it. Um, and it is, it's totally lit RPG. Um, but it just blows me away that this was was something else at first, uh, because it's so very realistic with that kind of thing happening in the games. 
And uh, th there's also a few other new things. Like, the, the Dark was a really neat place to visit, uh, and it was different from other game worlds in as, as so far as you, you pay to play per match. So there are things that you'll have to do. So if you want to fight somebody, you've got to pay, uh, and so on and so forth. And if you win, then you get X amount, whatever. Um, but, but that was a, a new concept. Like I haven't seen that happen anywhere else. Uh, so that was pretty neat. Uh, there were just some really cool concepts that I just thought really worked. Now, the one issue I had with this book, and it's just the one issue, is the narration. Now, while I found Guy Williams uh, to have a nice grizzled soldier voice that worked well for a war world kind of character, I don't think his voice had a lot of range. His cadence and rhythm barely ever changed, and I wasn't overly wowed by him. Um, uh, Williams, I don't want to say droned, but he, he barely varies his voice, you know, in, in most cases, and he, he does add emotion, but he kept on this really steady pace of talking that never amped up when, when it should have. Uh, and I don't know how to describe it other than, you know, he, it's almost like he's reading like, you know, um, reading off the page of a book and rather than reading it ahead of time and kind of knowing how he should be saying things, he's reading it word for word as it goes. Um, and again, he's crisp, he's clear, you understand everything he's saying. Um, he does add a little bit of emotion and he does vary his voice just a little bit, not much, but it's not like the, the, I have high expectations for my narrators. Really, really high expectations. I mean, if you look at the caliber of people that we have in this genre, in this community for narration, it is off the charts. I mean, you have other communities like Fantasy has things that come up and uh, they have okay people and, you know, so on and so forth. But, but you cannot compare pound for pound, weight for weight, narrator for narrator anybody against Little RPG. There's just no way, because our narrators will nab anybody who comes at them. They just will. And, you know, Williams is not a Little RPG narrator. He may be an MMO punk narrator, I don't know, but it's not a Little RPG narrator. Um, he just doesn't have the, the, the je ne sais quoi that, you know, most of our people do. Um, now, that's not to say he ruined the book for me, but he did knock it down a little bit because the the story is really cool it's smart and it, it's 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 a thinking kind of story because there's a lot of stuff happens and you feel for the character but my score would have been higher if it were not for the narration flaws i like the book but i have to say 7.3 out of 10 stars because Williams didn't do much to elevate the story, and that is what I expect a narrator to do. I don't expect a narrator to carry a story like this. I expect a narrator to carry a story like this. They take it from here and put it up to here, um, because that's their job. Their job is to do more than just read you the lines. I can read lines and say, Times New Roman, 12-point font, Da, 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 la, 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 format painter it it's not going to be the same as if you know jeff hayes came in and was like it was a times new roman font with a paint format and paste and and blah 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 page layout and references he would give it like like what i just did he would have made that sound really interesting i can't and williams doesn't do much to it either um so, like I say, if this has been SBT, Padel, Daniels, Parsno, Rennie, Taylor, Adams, I could see this book crushing it uh, in lit. But honestly, I, I think the narration's holding it back some. Great concept, good writing, mediocre to fair narration, and so it's not going to go as far as it should. Um, and I hate to say that, uh, because it's a really good story. And if you get the book, you'll probably love the book. Uh, and again, I'm going to have to look to see who narrated the precursor to this book. Because if it's Williams, I'm just going to skip it. But I don't know. I'll try it if it's somebody else. Um, but the book is really good. Um, and, and there is a, a, another book after this that is, that is out. But again, it's going to depend on Williams' presence and, and me deciding whether I want to sit through that again. Because um, he didn't make it horrible for me, but he didn't bring it to life. And I need Dr. Frankenstein 
at the helm of the audio controller. Uh, I really do, because he will bring it to life every single time. And I think what I got was Igor uh, in this one. Uh, and I'm not talking about from the movie Igor, because he was the smart one. Oh, 7.3 stars. Whew. So, <laughs> the next book, the very next book I'm going to be reviewing for you today is The Curse of Hurley Ridge, First Dive World Tree Online Book 1 by M.A. Carlson, narrated by Annelise Rennie, with a book length of 21 hours and 52 minutes. Oh my god, that is a huge number of hours. I swallowed once and took a few calming breaths before taking the last dozen steps to parlay with the murderous PKer. Walking toward him, I took a moment to observe my enemy. He was probably a few inches shorter than me, but between his boots and overly large hat, he was now nearly the same height. He wore a bright red leather jacket and had a cutlass sword strapped to each hip. The curly mustache and small goatee finished the man's look. The more I looked, the more I was sure he was going for a pirate look. It was very cliche. You got guts, kid. I'll give you that. Not much for brains, but plenty of guts, he greeted me, smirking as if he was ultimately superior to me in every way. He had 376 judgments against him. If I accomplished nothing else today, I would kill this man. I shrugged, trying for nonchalance. Probably more along the line of I'm expendable, the man laughed. <laughs> What's your name? The PKer asked. Can't read? I asked him, pointing above my head. So, like I said before, this is one of those books I have been wanting to get to you and review before I got really sick. Uh, in fact, it was going to be the very first thing that I reviewed after episode 39, uh, which I had pre-taped. Um, and I, th this was like my number one. I'm going to start with this book and go right at it with you guys. And everything just kind of went to hell and I couldn't get to it. So I'm sorry it's taking me so long to get this to you guys. This is one of those books, okay, that you listen to and you wonder why everyone isn't talking about it. Personally, I kind of think Hurley Gridge kind of got a hit with a situation like a summer blockbuster smash. Uh, and by that, I mean, it's like, like you, you get a great movie that comes out, like let's say The Princess Bride, um, that just would, is an amazing, amazing movie. Um, but it also came out like right after Fatal Attraction. And Princess Bride had like some really crappy, um, advertising and commercials and stuff and it didn't grab your attention so everybody in the country was going to see you know fatal attraction when they should have been going to see princess bride because how many people today talk about fatal attraction very few how many people can quote almost every single line of the princess bride anybody who's ever watched that movie okay um but at the time you just could not compete with the amazing craziness of glenn close's rabbit boiling psycho chick um i mean hell even i went to see fatal attraction instead of princess bride uh, and i can remember being in the theater and seeing the bride advertised on the lo lobby walls thinking that's a that's a, a teenage girl love story why would i ever go watch this and i think that happened here i think several books just kind of popped up all at the same time uh, and kind of clobbered this one in the pile. Uh, I think it just kind of got released at the wrong moment, um, and it kind of got lost in the shuffle, because I haven't heard a lot of people talking about this, uh, which I'm hoping to change that now. I mean, I really, really think this is a good book. I think it's it's going to be an incredible series, and I think it's got a huge amount of potential, because it, it, it isn't your average storyline. Uh, even if it does have things in it that I... I would almost tell you, I don't like this stuff. Uh, I enjoyed it. Now, now, you know, one of the big things I'll talk about first is my pet peeve is getting into the game quickly. Um, I hate it when you take a tenth of the book to get into the story of the game. Like, you know, we had to get, get all this stuff lined up before we go into the pods and we have all this other stuff to, to kind of fill you in. Like, you know, my mother has cancer and, you know, the dog died and the banks were closing on the house. All these horrible things are happening. I like to get into the story of the, the, the game portion as soon as possible. I tend to get very bored or annoyed with books that take very, take very long before they get their characters in the game. 
That's not here. Um, I, I mean, it was almost like we just get to meet the MC and then suddenly he's in the game. And I'm like, holy crap. Is he getting back out? Because if he gets back out, I'll be really pissed. Um, because this was perfect. It was like he's, hello, I'm in the game. Yay. Yay. That's how you do it. That is how you do it. You don't screw around taking forever and ever and ever to get a character into the game. For, not for a little RPG. Not for that. Um, you can do that with a Portal Fantasy because you're going to set stuff up. Get him in the game. And this, this was like, in the game. And I'm like, yeah, this is it. So, um, it, you know, the story, however, is almost, almost a slice of life. And, you know, I'm not a huge fan of those. But lately, I've been opening up to the concept and I'm enjoying them more and more. Uh, I want to be fair about it. Uh, I have never been a big, we'll just, we'll just wander around and see how things kind of go, kind of story kind of guy. I like to have, this is the beginning, this is the middle, this is the end. I like a succinct, this is how the story is told and where it wraps up, this is the point. Um, but I, I know there, there have been several books lately that I've said, this is a slice of life and I've really enjoyed it. And this is another one of those books. Um, so I, I think Mr. Carlson is, is kind of smoking me. Um, he's hoisting by hoisting me by my own petards. Uh, because, again, this is a slice of life book, but I enjoyed it. Um, now, to be fair, to be fair to myself and to you, um, it might be slice of life, but the book does have paths that it follows. Now, it kind of... Oddly switches gears. I don't know how, how or why. Um, but like, th th there's one portion of the book that is really about like PVP stuff and, 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 you know, that, that's kind of thing. And then right after that, it goes into this mystery that evolves and pulls a story in a direction that is both fun and exciting and unexpected. But at least it has paths. Like, this deals with this, then this deals with that. Um, another aspect that worked for me a lot was the entire gaming system. This is really well thought out. Now, the only only thing, and I'm going to say this, is this is one of those things that bothered me, but not a huge amount, but I had to point this out, um, it was the way that the only way to really improve yourself was by training, um, and which is great. I have no problem with that. There, there's no cheat points to pop up so that when you level, you know, you can just say, well, I'm going to put five points uh, uh, into strength, and then you're suddenly a big, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger hulking kind of guy. Here, you have to hit the metaphysical gym. Well, not even metaphysical. You've got to hit the physical gym and go and train and improve yourself. Whatever it is, you've got to apply yourself in order to, to improve. And, and that would be really fine if it just kind of happened periodically and they said, here's what's going on or something. But it's a frequent thing. Um, and all I could think of a lot of times was, you know, here's Rocky. You know, hey, Mick, yeah, yeah I want to be the, the champ. And, and, and Mick's trainer yells, well, you're going to eat lightning and crap thunder, Rock. Now go chase a chicken. And, you know, Rocky's out there chasing chickens trying to get his speed up, to, you know, so he can do this. And then we level up uh, and Bye Bye's out there drinking. Um, I'm sorry, Bye Bye is the MC. So we level up, and then suddenly Bye Bye's out there drinking six dozen raw eggs and cereal. Pharrell is telling him to go chase cats, uh, and and then we 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 don't get a montage scene, which I would have liked. That would have actually been pretty good. I would actually have appreciated one or four of those a couple of times. Now, obviously, I kind of jest. I kind I'm kind of picking on on poor Mr. Carlson here, um, but in truthfulness, in truthfulness, um, my son's were around when I listened to the book and every so often they would be a smart ass and they would come by playing I the tiger the longer they heard me listening to the book and I was like oh here we go okay here we go we're gonna go we're gonna throw down now um because it was one of those things where you know I've got to go train and do and practice and stuff like that and it's really not a big deal I, I, I like that actually a lot um as the storytelling goes for the game mechanics because it's different very different, um, and it sets itself apart from other books like this, uh, just because it is it is a different thing. Okay, um, 
And if that's the worst thing I had to deal with, then whoopity whoop. I mean, I love the book. I loved it. Uh, I can deal with non-training montages. You know, I don't need to see somebody out there running through the snow pulling a, a log that's chained around their neck to try and build up their, their stamina or, you know, swinging a 300-pound log uh, to build up their, their ability to swing a sword, that sort of stuff. Um, the book is long, and it's over 21 hours, so you get your money's worth. And y- you don't mind a time investment at all, and that's rare. Um, you know, like I said, I just have I have a book coming up at the end of this, the show um, that's not quite 21 hours long, and it, it did have parts that it dragged, and I'll be fair about it. You know, I hear I didn't feel like, well, can we just get through this, even during the training stuff. I just wish the training stuff would have been trimmed up and said he went to do this or that more than, than what it was because um, it, it just definitely felt like, oh, crap, they're going to, oh, here, here he goes, and, and, and then he has to go do this. Uh, I, I think that could have been kind of maybe flipped around a little bit, but it's still, it wasn't bad. The MC is very interesting, and there's plenty of action and mystery. I also appreciated how we stay in one spot for the entire novel. Uh, but the world building is obvious. Uh, a lot of thought went into this land and its people, just like the game mechanics. The game mechanics work really well, and the world is well thought out and developed. The fact that they stay in one spot and do their stuff there um, has no bearing, because I could say the same thing with like Chris Carney um, with his, his first book, where I'm thinking there's going to be a whole lot of stuff going on, and it's just a single dungeon delve. He never gets out of the dungeon. I love that book. And it's the same thing here. You can write a really great story and never go anywhere. You know, you don't have to cross great mountains and stuff like this. Carlson obviously put a ton, a ton, a ton of work into this book before he ever started writing. And I look at this as the way like Tolkien developed an entire language, not language, he, he developed entire languages, entire languages, whole geographies. He, he, he built up 10,000 years of backstory and so on before he ever put the words in a hole in the ground there lived a hobbit. Simple, simple sentence and about 400,000 hours of work put in before those simple words were ever uttered. And it's, it's, dichotomy is amazing. Because you would think that after a 200 years worth of effort of developing languages and geographies and backstory, you would have a little bit more flowery speech to start off with. But it's the simplicity that works, and it's the same thing here. The man really put in his time and effort to know this world, to have a great gaming system, and it shows and it pays off. And the book is well written. Again, I'm going to repeat that. It's well written. It's gripping and it's fun and i enjoyed it a lot um and again i don't have any slow spots i can't say that even with the the training stuff there, there's not any uh, slow stuff uh, it was just different and it stood out compared to the way most other systems are, are handled in books now can i just say can i just say this uh, i can because this is my show and i'm going to say what i want to say damn it and yeah, I'm sorry if I am swearing a lot. When you come close to death, you kind of get your, your vulgarity back a little bit. Um, so I apologize. Uh, but I simply love Annalise Rennie. Um, she is an amazing narrator. Uh, the work she has been doing is a real boon to the community. The last book that I got to hear her in was Richard Hummel's Radioactive Evolution, where she played a dragon. And this is so much better because, shh, narration, narration wise, it's so much better, so to speak. Mm hmm. That's a pun, so to speak, because she gets to play everybody in the book. Um, that's the best part, because Annalise just is one of those people that you say, yep, she's going to do it. Just like Andrea Parr Snow or, you know, Justin, Justin Thomas James or Jeff Hayes or whoever you want to throw out there. They can handle doing everybody in the book and you never blink. You never bat an eye. Um, she's one of those people that I could listen to all day. I, I, I would actually, I don't even like watch sports. I mean, the only thing I ever, like to do is I like to go to a real live baseball game. I will enjoy a real live baseball game in person at the stadium, um, but I don't like to watch it on TV and I don't like to listen to it on the radio. But I could handle her play by plays. If she was doing play by plays, I could listen to her do that. Um, I think she handles the characters with a lot of finesse and tells the story like she was living it. Uh, she rocks this book, okay? Just put it out like she rocks it, and I think it's obvious how much she enjoyed narrating it, which means that you 
will enjoy listening to her tell you the tale. That's how good it is. So final score, and I am going to say 8.4 stars. I believe this will eventually become a much bigger series. I think this is going to blow up over time. It's going to be one of those ones that sneak out and kind of builds up a following as word gets out and how good this is. Um, and they'll get noticed by the community for the great work that it is. Good characters, cool game system, a madcap narrator that takes you on a ride in her word mobile makes all this worthwhile. So 8.4 stars. All right. <clears throat> so for my final review for the evening. Uh, and again, I'm sorry, I will try to get more in later. Um, I'm doing my sound booth spotlight. So I'm going to be doing Obliteration, Unbound Death Lord, book two, by Edward Castle, narrated by Jeff Hayes, with a book length of 16 hours and 57 minutes. Major Stewart rose from where he had been examining a corpse. His black hair was cut short, and he was blind in the left eye. Like all the military walking around him, he was in uniform. How a half-blind man could become a major was a mystery to those who didn't know the unique set of abilities he possessed. Some who knew simply couldn't appreciate them. He was standing next to one of many bodies in the building, this one located in a corridor on the third floor. Reports from first responders made it look like it was a terrorist mass shooting, the kind of attack spontaneously made by a few people in support of their violent ideologies from time to time, but the Major was sure this was something else. Military level, he informed his superior, who was standing close to him. It was executed too well, if the witnesses are to be believed. Are you sure? The commander, an old and frail-looking male of Asian descent with blue eyes and dyed black hair, asked. I can remember, sorry I'm starting to get a little coffee here. Um, I can remember finishing book one in this series and thinking, damn, that was really good. And I'm only sorry we had to wait so long for this book to come out. Um, it's been a little while. I think it's been over a year, year and a half, something along those lines. It's been a long time, at least for me. Um, I don't know when the book exactly came out, but I just listened to it not too long ago. It was right before I, I went to the hospital and before I got really sick. Um, and I was just thinking, man, I, I wish this had come out earlier. I'm not a fan of recaps, okay? Um, they can be great on TV or a book, but they ruffle my feathers. I, I don't like them either place. I don't like them on movies, you know, if they're catching up something. I hate those things. Um, the recap stuff annoys me. And this book starts off recapping right away. Um, but I guess it's because you had such a long wait in between that most people need that help to recall. Now, I'm personally one of these people that say, look, either just jump right in and just pick up where it left off and, and it'll come back to you, or before you sit down to read this book, go back and read the other book or books so that you're up to date and you're not wondering what the hell's going on. Uh, that helps a lot, too, and it, and it eliminates the need for those recaps. Um, <clears throat> but when I review a book, I don't jump over any parts. I listen to the whole thing. Uh, just because I can't review something I haven't listened to completely. It, it doesn't seem like it's fair. Um, and this is one of those things where I would just say, everyone, okay, I, I know this has happened. I, I know this has happened. Let's just get along with it. So there is a recap. So if you're not a fan of recaps and you have no problems skipping, just skip it and get into the thing. The novel does a good job of intermixing gameplay and events in the real world. Now, normally, I'm not a big fan of jumping between two worlds. Like, you know me. If you get into the game, stay in the game. There's very few books I can think of where the real world is just as interesting as the game world. Uh, <clears throat> or even more, maybe, um, interesting than the, the game. And the only, you know, like, for example, Dave Wilmore's Stark Elf series. The, the, the real world is more interesting than the game world. And the game world is really interesting. But I really look forward to the parts of the real world because it's just got a lot going on. And you're like, man, that's just as good as the gaming. Okay? So Castle does succeed in balancing out the real world with the game world. And he kept me hungry for more as I listened. Oddly, the parts of the book that actually felt a little slow to me were those that were in-game and not the IRL portions. Um, Jack, the, the main character, um, he tries to deal with 
what he learned at the end of the first book. And he kind of goes maybe just a little bit crazy in the process um, because he sort of becomes like this mass murdering terrorist. So you really have to empathize with him to understand why he's doing what he's doing and who he's doing it to. And you have to ask if Jack is a monster or if he isn't just a little bit justified or if it's not a little bit of both. Uh, you know, and I personally like books to make you think. Thankfully, you can think while Jack will stomp the hell out of whatever comes at him in the game world, or even in real life. But you have to come to that conclusion, because the character needs to be empathetic. And I think that you do realize why he feels the way he does. Uh, you have to come to the conclusion whether it's justified or not. And that's it. Now, me, I don't care. You know, that he could blow up anybody, and I'm going to do a reading because it's not real world. Um, you know, if Mr. Castle there blew up a 7-Eleven to make a point uh, about its book, then I would be like, okay, I can't read the book. This is not real life. So, oddly, and this is just one of those things, I think the MC, um, Jack, becomes more of an a-hole in this book than he was in book one. But that's after he's learned everything that's happened and where he, why he's where he is at this moment. And it actually fits and plays well in the story. Because if you've been manipulated and lied to and tricked and just, you know, molded to be something that you don't want to be, uh, and you find all this out, well, you're going to be a little pissed off. And, and you're going to want some payback. So it fits really well with the story. Now, for me, um, the best parts of the novel were daggers. Uh, that's a character in the book. It's it's one of the, the, the secondary characters. I loved every moment that Daggers was on the page. If she were a character in a movie, then her actor would have gotten the Academy Award for Best Supporting Actress. As it is, I think Jeff Hayes deserves the audio version. Okay, like not the Grammy. He deserves an audio Oscar uh, because he really portrays Daggers amazingly. Um, he has several characters that I simply love to hear him in the role of, such as Miller from War Eternus, Andrea from Super Sales, uh, especially, most especially the fast-talking Quantum Hughes, uh, and so on. But it isn't his voice so much as his acting here that makes Daggers the star. Um, <clears throat> not that I'm saying his voice doesn't stand out, um, but when he does Miller, you know instantly that's Miller being, you know, and when you hear Andrea Pow, you say that's Andrea uh, from Super Sales. Don't do that with Daggers. Her voice is not like a, this is a standout voice. It's the way he acts her out uh, that really brings her to life. And that, to me, is just as important or maybe even more important than just having this really cool voice. Because you can't have an amazing voice for every single character. Not every character can have a standout voice and be amazing or the whole book is just mediocre because if everything in it is incredible, then nothing is incredible, and it's just a blah book. So I think that he put the effort into where it needed to be, and it belonged. Uh, he keeps her mysterious and deadly and trustworthy but suspicious, and an utter force to be reckoned with. Um, Hayes handles the rest of the tale as well with a plum and his usual vocal swagger. Uh, he's always amazing. I love Jeff Hayes. He's you know he's my favorite narrator. Um, and in spite of Jeff's best effort, you know, Jeff does a really good job, uh, there were several parts that I did seem to think that went on a little longer than you should have, like forever. Um, for example, the final fight, that actually drained my stamina. It drained my stamina. I felt my... Doo -doo -doo. Um, it was just like Jack against this endless horde of unrelenting humanoids. Um, and not that he was alone. He had people with him. He had he had an army with him. But it was just like this never-ending swarm that just kept coming and coming and coming and coming uh, to a point where even, even Castle had to word it as the fact that they had to to swap out places so that people could rest in between the, the people coming in the door and getting killed because they just couldn't keep killing people as they came into the room where they were at. Um, and, and it just kind of got to be a bit monotonous after a while. Like it was like one big fight after one big fight, after one big fight, after one big fight, after one big fight to get to the one big fight at the end. Um, and, and again, I'm not saying that I didn't like this book. 
I enjoyed this book immensely. I really did. But th that was just the way it felt. It was kind of like, um, I went to the ocean. God help me if I ever go to the ocean. Uh, and have my shoes off in the water, and I'm kicking the waves as they come in trying to stop it. And no matter what I do to the first wave, there's another wave that comes in right afterwards, and it just never stops. And eventually, I'm going to get pulled out to sea because I'm stupid laying there kicking waves. And I'm going to get exhausted, and the water's going to hit me and suck me out into the water. And that's really kind of what happened here. It was like, as good as the story is, it should have been trimmed up. I and mean, this is like an editing issue for me. Um, it should have been shortened a little bit at the end because I don't need like a, a four hour fight to get to the final boss, uh, so to speak. And that's kind of the way it felt. Um, and like you say, it's not to say that the spots aren't well written, but they're really longer than they should have been and it tuckered me out a little bit. The book is still fun. Still fun. Um, and the cliffhanger makes you hope that maybe there is a recap at the start of the third book so that you can remember what went on here when it finally comes out. Okay, um, so again, it may sound like I don't appreciate <laughs> or overly enjoy this book. I truly did. It's it just I had a couple of little road bumps that I had to go through. But otherwise, it's a really good listen. Um, and I, I don't think you'll have a problem with it. I, I think Jack is an interesting character. He's complex. It's not He's not a one-dimensional kind of guy. Uh, he's got a lot going on, especially in his head. Uh, and he, he just... Um, keeps going no matter what uh, and you have to respect that um, he does not quit he does not give up no matter how bad things look or how bad things get jack keeps going he never ever stops no matter how far his head goes underwater he keeps swimming um, just like dory just keep swimming just keep swimming so um you you will enjoy this book it's well worth it uh, and again for the amount of time that you you get from this book it's worth it just for that alone because as much as i i, I kind of pick on a little bit with the, the the big battle at the end um you you get a lot for the 19 hours that you're you're, you're paying for uh it, it's just a really good story uh and, and i do want to see what happens next i, I want to see what happens with jack because it does end on a cliffhanger um, my final score is going to be 8.1. I enjoyed it, but it did feel a little long in spots. I can't lie to you. Narration, mind-blowingly good. Uh, and the tale wraps up neatly enough to make you want the next novel right now. Not that it's wrapped up and done. It's just finished, and you're saying, I need this next book now. So give it a listen. Uh, if you haven't, get the first one, then this, and, and you'll have a good you know week if, if you spread things out, because there's a lot of reading there to go through. Uh, but you'll enjoy it, and you won't regret it. Well, everybody, believe it or not, the time has come for me to say farewell. Avita is saying goodbye. So I want to thank you very much for watching and listening, uh, taking your time to support me, as I said in the past. Um, so as you've been there for me, I'm going to ask if you could continue to support us. Uh, so if you like the Lit RPG audiobook podcast, just go to the Lit RPG podcast Facebook page or the YouTube page. You know, hit like or share and like the video. I really, really hope you've enjoyed the show. I mean, it means a lot to me to be able to do this. I'm so glad to be back. Uh, I'm, I'm so glad to be here doing this. I love this. I love the community. Uh, so leave co comments below, suggestions. You know, I'm going to get back to you. I'll respond. I really enjoyed the feedback. Uh, and remember, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, iTunes, Google Play, and even Stitcher. Okay, uh, so take care, God bless, and thank you all.